Good morning and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Dave Deacon filling in for Lindell Stout this week. And this week we're talking about the recent rains and what that means for the surface area. And we have Salih Tagvalian here to talk about those rains. Every, it, it, the, the rain has been nice, but has it really helped the irrigation and, and the surface water? Um, yeah, it has had a huge impact on, on our uh, surface water resources. Mm -hmm. uh, two of the lakes in Oklahoma that are major supplier of irrigation water are Canton Lake and Lake Lugard at Altus. Now, uh, right now, Canton Lake is uh, only four feet below the normal pool level. That's about 75% of the normal uh, capacity, the storage of the lake. And this is a significant improvement. Uh, four or five months ago, Canton Lake was at about 30%, and we've gone all the way to 75%. Now, if you look at Lake Lugard at Altus, we're at 100% of the pool capacity, which is really good. A few months ago, it was at 9%. One point to remember, however, is that um, it only takes a couple uh, dry years mm. for the lake levels to go back to where they were. If you look at data from previous years, you see that um, we went to this 9% in about two to three years. The levels really started going down in 2011, uh, 2009 and 2010 were pretty much uh, normal as far as, far as the uh, capacity in the lake. That, in, in the grand scheme of things, that's pretty quick as far as a, a crop goes. That's right. So, um, what, what it tells me is even though we've had all the rains and we're mm -hmm. in really good shape, this is really the time to think about the next drought mm -hmm. and prepare and conserve water so when the next drought hits, we're all ready for that. Now, in Oklahoma, not only do we have the surface water irrigation, but there's also a lot of groundwater used uh, for irrigation also. For the bedrock aquifers, the deeper aquifers, and there's two of them that supply irrigation water, two main one in Oklahoma, Rush Springs and Ogallala, we haven't seen much of an increase in the water level. There are two observation wells, again, by U.S. Geological Survey, north and south of the city of Eakley. And if you look at them, the two graphs uh, show the changes in the water table for the past four years. Uh, from July 2011 to July 2015 and you see that we are uh, we've been on the declining uh, trend it's been declining uh, continuously uh, if you look at the last couple months you see an increase about a foot of water level in these observation wells and that's a good sign that's the impact of the rain but we still have a long way to go uh, to the levels where we were in 2011 now if you look at Ogallala we have one observation well near the city of Texoma. The graphs for that observation well in Ogallala show no improvement at all. The uh, water levels are declining, so the, the Ogallala aquifer is still under stress and it hasn't showed uh, much response to recent uh, rain events. Now, there, there's a lot more that goes into a, an aquifer. In, in my mind, I, I picture it as this large cavernous space where, where there's just a body of water down there and, 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 it, and that would make it easier to refill, or refill, but that's not really how it works. No, an, an aquifer is really a body of uh, soil. It's mm -hmm. a soil formation. So it's, when we talk about groundwater resources, it's the water that's in between the pores and voids in between the soil particles. So we have a saturated soil, mm -hmm. if you will. There's no uh, huge area that we could uh, uh, we could store water in it. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of time there's there are hard pans and layers with uh, lower infiltration rates, uh, we, we in a lot of cases we get a lot a very small recharge mm -hmm. after all these rain events. So only a small fraction of the precipitation makes it down to some of these deep uh, aquifers. Now you actually have an event coming up here in August to talk about the irrigation across Oklahoma. Let's go ahead and talk about the event uh, coming up on the 18th. Yeah, we have organized the second Oklahoma Irrigation Conference. This year we're inviting speakers uh, from within the state, uh, specialists and engineers and scientists from Oklahoma, but we've also invited irrigation specialists from Kansas mm -hmm. and from Texas. And they're providing uh, lots of information on precision irrigation management, irrigation scheduling tools, um, apps and softwares for doing that, um, talking about managing salinity under irrigation, and many other uh, very interesting topics that will be discussed in this irrigation conference. And that's coming up on August 18th, and you guys have a website for that, right? That's correct. Okay, and we have a link to it on our website, sunup.okstate.edu.
Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Ada and Ardmore were racing each other on Tuesday and Wednesday to see who could score the highest rainfall. Ada won with seven and 92 hundredths inches. The yellow, orange, and red colors on a two-day map of rainfall through 5 p.m. Wednesday evening indicated areas that received four or more inches of rain. One of the interesting things about Tuesday and Wednesday's rain was the low wind speeds. At 10.30 Wednesday morning, most of the state had average wind speeds below 10 miles per hour, and winds were still light at 5 p.m. Wednesday evening. Tuesday showed how much rain and cloud cover drop water demand in the green areas on a map of potential water demand for mowed grass. The estimated water loss was low down around five hundredths of an inch. The two tan brown areas had lots more sunlight and higher air temperatures. Water demand in those areas was up closer to two tenths of an inch. Total solar radiation for Tuesday mimicked the water demand. The highest sunlight was in the panhandle and the far southeast. Higher sunlight, higher water demand. Here's Gary with a longer look at our rainfall. Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a great post Fourth of July week. Uh, you probably got wet in, in most places. Uh, everybody got some really good rain. So let's take a look at what we've seen for July thus far and also for the year thus far, see where we stand. We see widespread totals for July thus far of about six to 12 inches across south central Oklahoma and around two to four inches across uh, most of the rest of the state. So far, the statewide average for July is 3.13 inches. Now, normal for the entire month of July is 2.88 inches, so we're already above normal for the month. What about for the year? Well, when you look at the entire year thus far, you see totals go up to more than 50 inches in some cases. The statewide average for the year is 32.26 inches, uh, nearly 13 inches above normal. South Central Oklahoma, where the, the really big totals are, is about 26 inches above normal already. Tishomingo leads the, the, the way with more than 56 inches so far in 2015. That's incredible. But eight other stations are also above 50 inches for the year. Now, Boy City's on the other end of the rain gauge with about 11.8 inches so far, but that's still above normal for those folks out in the far western panhandle. Now when we look at the departure from normal rainfall maps for the year, only a small area around Osage County sits below normal, uh, but just slightly. Now the rest of the state ranges from about two to in some cases more than 24 inches above normal. And we talked about that just a bit earlier. So if we're not careful, 2015 is going to end up topping that 1957's wettest year on record mark. We're certainly on pace to do that. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Recently, we talked about this being a great time of year for prescribed burns across Oklahoma. Here's John Weir to talk about the regrowth after those burns. We're out here west of Stillwater um, on, o on Oklahoma State University land, and, and there was a prescribed burn of thousands of acres earlier this spring. Right. This is part of that uh, reclamation area out here west of Stillwater from the OSU lands where uh, a few years back come in and did a mechanical treatment removing all the cedars that we could get to and, and that they were getting to. Then following that up with prescribed fire this year. This was the first year they started implementing fire with the contract burners that OSU had hired to do that. And uh, I believe the contract's about burning about 14,000 acres mm -hmm. in a three-year period, and they got over half of that done this year, uh, looking on that. So, again, a lot of changes going on out here west of Stillwater. Looks looking really good. Especially, you know, the cedar removal made everything look a lot better, but the fires are making things look look really good as well. Now, now, now talk about the difference between cutting down a cedar tree and then actually preventing future cedar trees. Well, again, you know, OSU's again following our you know good recommendation of what what you need to do to manage land. Right. Again, the land had gotten too far away right. that fire alone just wasn't going to get it back right. as quickly and rapidly as you need to get to do. So we had to come in and do mechanical treatment because a lot of the cedars were large and trying to get them down. So again, we come in and mechanically remove them. If you just do mechanical treatment on eastern red cedar, that's fine. You're gonna you're gonna kill. A lot of the cedars, you're right. going to remove that. But if you don't follow that up with fire, all the seedlings are going to come up, all the small ones that the, the, the cutters couldn't see, couldn't get to, 
you know, they're still growing. And within a six to eight year period, you're gonna be right back to where you're at. So you're essentially wasting your money by doing mechanical treatment and not following up with fire. So again, we mechanical treated these areas, we're following up with fire. So we're gonna be way ahead of the curve on the Eastern Red Cedar coming back. Mm -hmm. And so again, we're also, fire's not a one-time deal. Right. So this is not gonna be just a cut and burn one time. Mm -hmm. We're gonna keep continually, every, about every three years, we're gonna continually keep burning this area to keep it looking good, mm -hmm. keep the cedars back, get it back in balance of where it needs to be. So John, why why three years? Why, why a magic number of three years? Uh, from, from all the work that's been done and passed all the way from western Oklahoma and drier climates, you know, 20 inches of rainfall all the way to work that we've done in southeastern Oklahoma in the 50, 60 inch rainfall zone, that seems to be a magic number of about three years before woody plants get back to where they were at prior to fire. Mm -hmm. So again, that, that percent cover coming back on that. Also, you look at a lot of the historical fire information from fire scars and stuff mm -hmm. that's been done in this region and stuff. And that seems to be about two to two to four years, three years right in that is what the historical uh, fire records and stuff also show mm -hmm. how often this, this country burned. Uh, if you're trying to get land back to what historically it looked like and, and doing that, you know, a, a two to three year fire frequency is what was occurred in most of Oklahoma. Uh, you know, as you get drier, you get further west, it slows down a little bit, mm -hmm. but even work that's been done in southwest Oklahoma showed that, you know, every four years, even in drier parts of southwest Oklahoma, it burned about every four years. We're we're three months, four months out of uh, out of this burn, and we already have vegetation under you here. You bet. That's right. Uh, this area here was burned in in late March right. uh, time frame, and again, you, we've we've had again tremendous rain. We've right. had some great rains. We haven't had near as much as southern Oklahoma has, but we've had adequate rainfall here in in uh, north central Oklahoma. Great response from the fire. Uh, we do see, you know, as you look around, we're, we're standing in some across timbers, post oak blackjack community area here. Uh, we do see some heavy damage from the fire. We've got some, got some, uh, some of the oak trees that are probably going to be top killed because of, again, that's due to the fact that there hasn't been fire in this area right. in for decades. Mm -hmm. And so when you're going to reintroduce fire in the, into an area that hasn't been burned for a long time, you get a large accumulation of fuel, especially in these forest type areas where you get a lot of accumulation of fuel from down debris from ice storms, wind storms, just old trees that have been, that have died back. A lot of these trees, they're all going to re-sprout. You're not going to kill them totally out. Right. The top may die, but they're going to re-sprout. As repeated fires goes through, it'll clean up a lot of this, more of this woody debris in here, clean this up and actually get this back to more of a savanna or a park-like open under, with an understory of grass and forbs coming through and then this overstory of trees coming through. It's got kind of park-like setting. Well, thanks a bunch, John. And if people want to learn more about this, they can go to sunup.okstate.edu. There's a lot of volatility in the grain markets right now. And Kim, let's start with an overview of those markets and start with wheat. Uh, you looked at uh, wheat contract. Uh, it's been trading from uh, $5 to $6.11. We hit that uh, peak last week. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, in this week, we traded between $5.74 and, and close to that $6.11. Uh, you just look at that wheat contract. If we could break that 611, which I think the odds are against that, then we would establish an uptrend. Uh, right now, the the market looks like that we're just going to continue this sideways pattern, uh, probably you know in a plus or minus 30 or 40 cents off the current price. Now there was an 80 cent rally in corn prices, and what's the market offering for harvest delivery? Well, you look at the uh, corn on harvest delivery. It's uh, the Chicago Board of Trade uh, December contract price, and uh, that contract's been running from 363 to 440. We're right up against that 40 or in that 440 area. Uh, the range uh, this week, uh, you know, 420 is the so support po uh, point below that. Uh, the basis in central Oklahoma for harvest delivered corn is about a minus 25 or 25 under that December contract. That gets you about $4.15 uh, for harvest delivery in central Oklahoma. The Panhandle area, 25 over, so that'll get you about 465 in those areas. And what about sorghum? 
time. Sorghum basis is running about a minus 10 for central Oklahoma. So that gets you about 430, 440 minus 10, 430. Uh, in the uh, Panhandle area, it's even. So whatever that December contract is for corn, uh, that's what the forward contract is for harvest delivered grain sorghum. Now there was also a rally in the soybean prices, about $1.40. So what's the market offering for harvest delivery there? Yeah, it's been a good couple of weeks really for all three, you know, wheat, corn, and beans. Uh, we saw that uh, soybean contract increase from about $9. That's the uh, Chicago Board of Trade November contract price from $9 to $10.40. Uh, the basis for harvest delivered beans just about anywhere in Oklahoma or the Texas Panhandle is 90 under that CBT uh, November contract price. So you put that price at uh, say uh, $10 good even number to calculate with. Uh, that's going to give you about 9.10 for the forward contract prices. Of course, as that uh, price moves, just take that 90 cents off of it. We've had a good rally in corn and beans. A, I'd say a good rally, but it's not as good in, in wheat. Uh, if they can break out the top, then you can get, a, you can get some uptrends going and, and continue. It's more likely in beans and corn than it is wheat. Right now, I think the wheat's just going to water around until we get into that August, September time period to see what's happening in the world with world production. Okay, thanks, Kim. Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Summertime is obviously a very busy time for folks on any cow-calf operation. We've got the time when we have to put up the hay, perhaps we're weaning those fall-born calves, but one of the chores that we can't let slip through the cracks is taking good care of the mineral nutrition of these cattle, making sure that our mineral feeders are well charged, and we're getting the kind of intake of that mineral that we expect. It's important that we take time to monitor how much mineral our cattle are consuming so that uh, we can make adjustments if they're not consuming enough of the mineral that uh, we're putting out. For instance, if we're putting out several hundred pounds of mineral in mineral feeders for a large pasture full of, of cattle, we can calculate the number of cows the number of pounds that they're consuming, the number of days it takes to do that, to see if those cattle are consuming two to three to four ounces per head per day, which are generally the recommendations that we need. This is extremely critical if we're using one of the medicated minerals, one of those that might contain some chlorotetracycline as a preventative for the, the bloodborne disease anaplasmosis making sure that those cattle are getting a correct intake amount is, is very important to give them the best uh, protection possible. If you're just using a, a regular mineral mix, let's say you mix your own that's half dicalcium phosphate and half salt, and we're not getting the kind of intake that we'd like on a per head per, per day basis, generally we'd like to get two to three ounces per head per day, I'd suggest that you uh, add a flavoring agent Something as simple as cottonseed meal or soybean meal in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 percent of the mineral mix will help to encourage higher intake of that mineral so that you get uh, more of those things going into those cattle as you would like to have that happen. Mineral nutrition is very, very important. Whether it's in the summertime out on native pasture or in the winter where cows are on wheat pasture, which is particularly low in magnesium and we have to take care of, of that mineral need as well. I think that it's worth your time and effort to go to the SUNUP website. That's sunup.okstate.edu. Look under show links and download the brochure that's specifically designed to give you a lot of information about mineral and vitamin nutrition of beef cattle. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow Calf Corner. Well, the numbers are in from last year's value enhancement programs in cattle sales. And Gant, what kind of numbers did we see? Dave, we, we last year, as, as all cattle producers know, we, it was a great year. It was a record year uh, for those cow-calf producers uh, and that calf crop. Uh, and with OQBN and the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network, it was no different. We, we saw record uh, high premiums. It was our second uh, highest overall enrollment in terms of, of, of cattle numbers. Um, and, and we chalk it up as, as a success uh, to all cattle producers generating about 
1.2 million dollars of extra income to the state of Oklahoma. Uh, this year uh, we're, we're kind of looking uh, to be successful again. Um, uh, typically what we see the value of these preconditioned animals are about 8 to 10 percent uh, of, of, of their overall cost um, and, and we'll see that again this year. That's why we had such a high jump uh, in, in the premiums last year and we'll see another pretty good uh, return on investment for the, as, as those premiums but will we'll be about eight to ten percent again this year. Now, now, speaking of this year, you guys have already set up the dates for the OQBN sales for this year. Absolutely. We'll, we'll start uh, October 28th is okay. our first sale uh, in, uh, in Cherokee, and then we'll move on down uh, to Elk City out in western Oklahoma. And uh, as we move forward, we'll, we'll have sales in, in Tulsa uh, and in Matt McAllister, and, uh, and then uh, Pawnee and uh, in Blackwell as well. And, and then, of course, we'll have uh, our largest numbers will be at uh, the OKC West sale barn uh, in El Reno this year. Um, we've actually had some changes uh, to that particular sale. We've sold so many cattle in conjunction with the uh, Integrity Beef program is that we've had to separate those sale dates. So we, we've set those sale dates as uh, November, uh, the second week of November and the second week of December. Now talking about those sales and, and being in the middle of July right now, producers need to be thinking about setting up cattle for those sales. Absolutely. You know, we're always looking forward to, to how we're going to manage our herd and how we're going to manage our calf crop. The, the biggest thing with these type of, of VAC 45 programs is actually the uh, the, uh, the the predict, production risk, excuse me, uh, and actually managing those cattle where we can keep them healthy uh, and, and keep them alive, uh, essentially. So some other things we might want to look at other than just the futures market in December is is what we have going on this year is, is rain, as everybody mm -hmm. knows. Um, and so we have, have ample forage supply. Um, we really haven't cut any hay yet. Which, which we'll need to, to supplement these calves in a dry lot. But, uh, but, but we'll have a, a lot of hay. It may not be the best quality hay, but so we may have to supplement a little higher energy and, and a little more protein to these calves. One thing that producers may be benefiting from and may not realize it would be weight gain. Absolutely, the, the value of gain on these animals in, in a preconditioning program is essential. Mm -hmm. We can't have those animals stagnant. They really have to be gaining. And here recently, the value of gain on these lighter animals uh, have been well over a dollar. Um, and, and we've seen for years and years and years that, that that number is between 60 and 80 cents. So very valuable in, in terms of, of economic power to producers. Okay, thank you much, Gant. And for more information on the OQBN sales and sale dates, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. You may have seen videos online promoting agriculture, but the Peterson Farm Brothers of Kansas have a new take on it. They recently showed Oklahoma 4-H'ers why it's important to spread the word about where the world's food comes from. So my brothers and I, what we do is we make YouTube videos and we started that about three years ago, almost to the day. Uh, it was June 2012. Um, we made our first music video and posted it to YouTube. And uh, our goal was just to, to impact, you know, to have a, a, a video to show our family and friends to, so they could see what we do on our farm. Uh, but once we were finished with the video, uh, we knew it was better than we originally intended and, and we knew it had a chance to go farther and it ended up getting five million views in, in one week and uh, from then on we've you know just used that platform um, to continue make videos and, and also have other social media efforts where we we try to advocate for agriculture and show people what uh, family farmers are really like. Well um, I've been watching him on YouTube uh, do his advocacy for farming and was interested in that. And when we picked the theme of all about that farm, I thought it kind of fit together as an overall, uh, how they're getting it out to the world and showing everybody a young, old city rule about farming and how, how we get our food. Because, um, you know, 4-H's, they don't come from all walks of life, you know, they don't all come here for, as in agriculture, they have Lego robotics and other uh, projects they work in and so this way they can learn about agriculture and 
that their food just doesn't come from the grocery market and they can learn about the hard work put into it. Uh, my favorite part is is probably things like, like this, um, you know, um, speaking to youth, talking to kids and having an impact on, on the next generation. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we do our videos is, is to help educate people, but another, another reason we do it is, is just to hopefully inspire uh, people, young and old, uh, to, to have a passion for farming and, and to, to want to be on the farm. And, uh, you know, as we, you know, try to move this next generation into production agriculture, they have to want to do it. And uh, hopefully this, this helps them with that. Learn that, you know, um, you can just be a farm boy out on the farm and you can still make a large impact on everybody, people all over the world. It's, it's important to, to get that next generation involved just because, I mean, they are the future and uh, agriculture can't take a step back. I mean, we've got to feed more and more people and we've got to do it in more efficient, sustainable ways. And I mean, the next generation is going to be a huge part of that. And if they're not passionate about solving those issues, um, you know, we're not going to be able to do it. And so I think it's really important to get them excited and, and to get them in, involved and passionate about, about the future. Well, he's young and he's excited and he's using social media to better the society, I think and getting his word out and his message to the people, the young people of the world with something that they enjoy, music. Music speaks to everyone. Um, well, I mean, uh, the population of, of farmers compared to the rest of the population is down to like 2%, and um, people are just becoming more uh, removed from where their food comes from, and uh, that's leading to a lot of just uh, misperceptions about farmers, and, and people just do, don't seem to understand farmers anymore. Uh, they either don't think about them at all and forget that they exist, or um, they, you know, criticize them a lot for some of the methods that they use to, to grow food and uh, we just see a lot of, of misinformation out there on the internet and so that's what motivated us to continue to make videos and, and advocate and uh, and uh, but we always you know we say we can't do it by ourselves and, and it's not like just a few of us in agriculture should be advocating uh, it should be a, a group effort um, because yeah we only make up two percent of the population and so it's going to take all of us reaching that other 98 to to make that difference well thank you for joining us this week on sunup if you saw something on the show that you'd like to learn more about visit our website sunup.okstate.edu and while you're there check out our social media i'm dave deacon and remember Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.